today we're going to take your questions on the theme we've been discussing all month, which is how to gain someone else's interest, how to break that ice, and essentially how to start a conversation. Today's guest to help us answer your questions and some of our own is actor, comedian, and he's even a magician, which we'll get into yes, a little I later, am. Chris Williams. You may know his face and even his voice from national commercials, from TV where he co-stars in Silicon Valley as Hoover, the security guard at Hooli. He was crazy-eyed killer on Curb Your Enthusiasm. In the movies, he was in Dodgeball with Ben Stiller and Vince Vaughn. And he's in a new Amazon original pilot called Upload and a movie with Ethan Hawke called Nailbiter, which isn't quite out yet. Exactly. He's a busy guy. We're very grateful he's able to make it to the studio today to help yeah. us answer some of your questions and give us some real truth about what it's like to be an actor and face so much rejection. We're going to delve into <laughs> that and some fun questions from our listeners. And as always, it is important to break the ice in any field we're in. Acting is no different. We know the value of who you know and how they know you, as exactly. you told me earlier. So we're going to be delving into that. As you recall on our first impression episode, we talked a lot about body language and how important that is when we walk into a room and set the tone. And we would love to know what your thoughts are. Obviously, with auditions, before you even say that first line, you're making an impression. And is there something going through your mind to set you up in that room? And is there something you're cueing on body language wise to nail it? One of the first things that you do as you walk into a room, if it's uh, if people are watching you walk into the room, you can actually use the door as a frame. So pausing for a second, so they look at you like a picture, <laughs> uh, which gives you, which especially if you're doing acting or that type of thing, right. it'll frame you to look, so they have an image of you as you walk in the room. And you have to walk in with confidence. Any, any place you go, you have to walk with confidence. You guys know that. Yeah. So, um, but first impressions are so important because you, you, it's all either downhill from there or to either maintaining or going or going up. Um, but it's uh, it's keying in on on how you're presenting yourself is so important because you may not even realize that you're slouching or you're slumping your shoulders or um, fid fidgeting or something like that. You, you need to put your shoulders back and walk in always with confidence and it's funny you mentioned the doorway because we have a doorway drill that we've been preaching for oh. years on this show that any doorway you walk through, audition or not, right. you anchor your body language to it. Meaning you stand up tall, you roll your shoulders back and down, your arms are uncrossed, and you put a smile on your face. And just anchoring it to that doorway, right? When it's we easy. walk through the door, yeah. that's when people are first seeing us. So that is a snapshot in their mind of that first impression. Exactly. It's also that easy cue to remind you that, hey, you're walking into something, something else or somewhere else and time to straighten it up. Um, is that an old actor's technique that's been around for a while? I've never heard that before. It is, uh, well, I've learned it from, there's a couple of different things I've learned from like either old acting techniques, because I've been doing it for 25 years now. Gotcha. So you develop things on your own as well yeah. as hearing from other things. One of the things that I also did in terms of uh, breaking the ice is you take control of the room, which I say, how are you? And they usually, no one is going to say, nothing they will respond to you like oh, i'm fine and if it pertains to a character for instance i would say how are you and they say well you know i'm good how are you and i'm like well and if it had anything to do with the character like the character this woman um paul paula she did pilot after pilot after pilot and i asked her like what you know what's your secret and she said she had an audition where it was a flustered woman who you know that's the character so she said oh how are you she's like oh i'm fine so like, how are you? And she said, oh, well, on my way here, I was getting in my car and I lost the key and I couldn't find it. And I was lit and the car started rolling. So she went to this whole thing already setting herself up as that character. So um, and also, you know, like peacocking, wearing something that will draw the attention to. And they'll say, well, why do you have that Superman shirt on? Or, oh, let me show you my Superman socks, which also keys into remembering something about you that they would not have necessarily put together. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, with these auditions, right, there's a moment where you're you, right, and then there's the moment where they go, all right, now be the character. 
So it's interesting that she's dropping in character as part of her introduction. Is that something that you've picked up as well and well, started applying? Well, it, but was it really her? Or was she telling a story like the character that she was doing? Interesting. So that's that's the... When I used to go into an audition that when I was young and, and going into an audition, I used to call it the vacuum because you walk in there and if you're so nervous and you're trying to figure things out and you're saying the lines and you want to do well and, and then suddenly you think and then you're literally out the door and I feel like you're just sucked out of out of a vacuum. You just popped out of a vacuum. You're like, well, what just happened for five minutes? I don't remember a thing that occurred. So it's the breathing, taking your time and taking control of your space and your time. So let's talk about the drive over there. Are there mantras <laughs> or things you have going on mentally? To well, I, you, you know, no matter how how long I've been doing this, I still struggle. You will always find actors in their cars after an audition going, oh, I should have done it this way, or I should have done it that way, even if they did a great job or, or didn't even get the role. So I still struggle with how I approach going to an audition, and it depends on if I know the cast and directors beforehand, if I'm comfortable with them, do I wanna have banter with just me beforehand and tell a story, or do I wanna, if it's a specific character like Crazy Eyes Killer, when I went in to play a gangster rapper, if you look at me, I do not look like anywhere, I'm from Chappaqua, New York, Millwood, New York, <laughs> I do not look like a gangster rapper, but for me to go into that audition, I left my house, I had a, a wife beater on, some you know big old baggy pants this is you know back in 2003 i had uh, two uh fangs like <laughs> silver fangs and i had a tattoo on my arm i don't have any tattoos but i put a big wolf and i call myself the wolf man right yeah because that gotcha. would be a rapper the wolf man and i and i and i didn't I have blue eyes so i put brown contacts in because it totally changes my look and i was scruffy and I, you know, so I left with a with a bandana and a hat to the <laughs> side, and I left my house like that, just to see what it felt like to be in that character. So, you know, when I got in my car, first of all, I was I was afraid of getting pulled over by the cops and be like, no, really, no, it's a character, no, really, I'm Chris, you know, I went to George now, no. so so, but I left and I went into a purposely went into a, a, the wrong office as. The Wolfman, whatever, and I said, "Oh yeah, I'm looking for uh, Kirby enthusiasm." And to see the visceral effect that sure. she had, and she was like, "Um, yeah, it's 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 down there, it's the right." I was like, "Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot." You know, you know what I mean? Like you right. have to go. I was like, "Oh, it's fucking working." You know, it's working. Like, oh my god, it's kind of work. And so, in order for me to go into that audition, I had to be that character because Master P, Ghostface Killer. Uh, Mike Epps, like all these guys, Sticky Fingers, they all read for the role. Oh wow! But to but to you have to know the sensibilities as an actor. What makes Curb Your Enthusiasm funny, right. which is the push and pull. So when I left uh, that audition and I went in, he Larry thought I was an actual a rapper because I, he's like, no, Larry, he's, he's an actor. Yeah, he's. <laughs> but uh, it's that. You, you have to own whatever you're going to go into the room with. Not necessarily if you're not a, an actor, but just own who you are as you enter a room, you know, and what you can contribute and what you bring to the table. Do you feel for large roles that there is a thin line of getting locked into that character? Like we um, outside looking in, we always hear about certain actors who who get stuck and who have found it difficult to find their way out of that character once they have. Uh, put themselves in it for so long. Well, a, that's a double-edged sword because for me, I don't have, it would be nice sometimes to have that locked in the character. Oh, if we need a gangster or whatever, or we need this type of character, Chris Williams is the guy. Yeah. But I've done so many different types of gotcha. characters. I can do anything, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like, oh, if we need this, yeah, Chris can do, Chris can do that. Right. But, you know, so... I understand that it's a double-edged sword. Like sometimes you want to be locked in that way, but right. sometimes you want to get, you know, be have the freedom to do other roles and and stuff like that. Yeah, it's like the mobsters, it's the Sopranos, mm -hmm. right? They're, exactly. They're, these Italian guys are cast in the exact same roles repeatedly. You're like, hey, I remember him from that other <laughs> right, right. mob movie, <laughs> right? And like uh, uh, Marco, the the Mexican drug lord, wasn't he in Break? Oh, he's also in this. <laughs> he's like, mm -hmm. He plays. There's a guy who has like. Uh, 
I think his name was Marco in like 16, like like 10 films. <laughs> his IMDb. <laughs> his IMDb Marco. Oh, Marco in all different roles. Yeah, exactly. And Danny Trejo is another one of those guys who right. always is playing some convict or, you know, some crazy street gangster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So this magician thing. Yeah. How, how did this get started? Well, when I was uh, 40, I, I, I've always done kind of magic stuff. Um, and so going back to, you know, ice breaking. Yeah, and, I was going to ask, right. is this something that um, has helped you in the ice breaking world? It, it has because uh, when I was 40, I got classes up at the Magic Castle, yeah. which is the Academy of Magical Arts here in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. So our I, first client ever just had his first show oh, at nice. the Magic Castle. Yeah, we yeah. met him 11 years ago. He was a street performer. Yeah, and he's we got done a chance a, to see him at the Magic Castle. What's a, his name? I know the this is what's his street name? Is it Frank Deville? Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. He did his first uh, long run. It was a, his first week. That's great. Um, and he's been busking uh, on the Jersey Shore for for years, and now he's made his way out to Santa Monica, and he's just loving it. Very cool. So they do classes up there too. Yeah, I they have classes up there. So I got it for my my fortieth birthday. And I was like, that's the greatest class I've ever taken because, you know, no one wants to go to class. You know, I was so jazzed to be like, teach me, like, tell me things, tell me things. <laughs> and then I took like three classes. And then to become a magician member, you have to do you have to learn three skill tricks, not like, you know, fake tricks. But you have to learn three skill tricks and do and perform it in front of a panel of some of the greatest magicians in the world. What would could you define what a, a skill a trick skill is? trick is? Yeah. Well. Uh, they know they can tell the difference between uh, um, there's gimmicks like you, you can like it'll a card will change or that okay. you can buy. Gotcha. These are strictly with your hands and sleight of hand. hand. I will do I'll do one for you later. Um, but so you, you're you're performing in front of and a routine. You have to patter. You have to present yourself. And so it was a little easier for me because I was an actor because I could perform. Sure. But I had uh, four of the, the greatest magicians, you know judging me i fooled one of them which was cool but judging me on on my my work and uh it's a lot of practice you know just like in anything that you do you got to practice to make it look like it's not right. you're not doing anything the few that i have met, and frank being one of them i mean he always had something in his hand that he was manipulating and it was just constantly working whatever that was whether it was a ball a cigarette a deck a of cards exactly. a rope just what can I do with this? How can I like? And it was, it was wonders of the m- amount of hours put into uh, those uh, those objects. Right. That's why you see a lot of nerds <laughs> <laughs> who are home by themselves, you know, playing with cards. There's like uh, one of my uh, uh, influences was uh, this magician called uh, Richard Turner, who has a um, movie right now called Delt, okay. uh, a documentary on him, and he said that he practiced for. 24 years 17 hours a day and he never he ne- always has a has a deck of cards even yeah. when he had her- heart surgery he had a deck of cards in his hand so that's how and th- now i'm an amateur magician like no, don't get me wrong you know there's amateur actors and yeah. then, you know if you i'm an am- I, I can do some magic but some of the guy the guys up there oh. are doing mind-blowing things amazing things so i just like to be in the club you know, I have to start around him. Right? I was like, yeah, he's, he's like, I'm in the room. We're yeah, exactly. Yeah, for those who don't know, I mean, the Magic Castle. You can do a little bit of explaining about the tradition um, of that place. I mean, it's 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 something just to be in it's there. Mecca for just magicians. and just walking in, I finally had got the opportunity to go to see a friend, and it was it was a wonderful experience from going in, having dinner and drinks, and just how nice everyone was. Right. It's. 55 years old, He's, this family just started it because they had a love for magic, and now uh, it's one of the only places in the world where it's dedicated to magic, and you have to dress up. Yes. You have to, men have to be in a jacket Which by tie. by LA standards is pretty rare these Exactly. Days, right? Well, anyway, you, exactly. Um, you have to be in a, you can't even take your jacket off in the club. You can't take photos anywhere in the club, yeah. no selfies, nothing. The women have to be in dresses, so everyone's dressed up. It's like old school. It's, like it's yeah. taking it back to... The times when, you know, people actually dressed up to go to the movies or, you know, dress up to fly on a plane. Um, and it's a uh, and you can't be you can't go unless you're invited by a magician's mm-hmm. member or an associate member. So it's a kind of a, a, there's an exclusive exclusivity to it as well. And uh, I've been a member for 10 years now. 
this will be in September will be my 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 tenth year, so I'm I'm excited about that. It's it's a fun place to go, and so and whenever I have guests in town, um, I oh, just yeah. yeah, people blow their blow their minds with some of the great. It's interests. one of those places where if you get an invite, you're going. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> right? you're not like I don't know, maybe next week I'll squeeze you in. You're going. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a fun place. And for us, what was so great about it is the rooms are so small, right? You get up there and you're expecting to be in a larger auditorium, but most of the rooms are very intimate. You're in there mm-hmm. with like 15, 20 other people. And even though Johnny and I were like focused like hawks on their hands and the ropes and everything, still couldn't figure it out. Yeah, it's like a total pros. There's well, a close-up gallery. There's a parlor of prestidig- prestidigitation. I can and there's it. magic tricks and illusions built into the place. So certain walls. Uh, I was also told some of the bar stools will raise and uh, come down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Irma, the, the uh, piano, the, the ghost piano. Yeah. Yeah, you can request a song from her, and, and she will play it. it. Yeah, it's so pretty it, I cool. mean, it's the building itself is a, a part of the act. Exactly, yeah. it's a cool place. So we also hear a little birdie tells us you're working on a reality show with your sister. Is this? Well, I'm I'm hoping. I, I like to travel. Uh, my sister is Vanessa Williams. Uh, I like to older travel. Or younger? She's older. Okay. Uh, like to uh, I like to travel and I like to eat. So trying to incorporate a show where I can travel and eat for free. Yeah, and hang you know, out with sis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Hang right on. So uh, it's like a cooking competition show. with. Uh, so we're trying to get that off the ground. Was you there – I, I, AJ and I both grew up as the older brother in the house to a younger sister. And mm-hmm. I, I think pretty much it's the same thing. Of There was always like, – at least in my family, my sister – I had found out – and a, AJ as well – we had found things that we were really interested in early in life and went at those things. And younger sister, not having those things, always was like, why does the older brothers get all the attention or they just seem to have it together all the time while younger sister's struggling? In your position, it sounds like a, a, a family that with a, with a lot of creativity and art going on. So what was that like growing up? Well, my parents were both music teachers. Ah. Elementary school music teachers. So... We had music and arts and all over the Hence house. The rapping, apparently. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> You're a rapper now, right? You got oh yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I could play a rapper on TV. <laughs> um, and then, uh, uh, you know, with sibling, there's always sibling rivalry, you know, between the two sure. of you. And it's we were four years apart, the, just enough to be gotcha. far, but close enough to be, you know, still uh, sibling rivalry. So when she became president of the of the, of the junior high school. Like, you know, I had to become president and then become freshman class president. And so I had a four year, you know, trail to try to get through. And then she did uh, um, performing arts, musical theater. And then my junior year in high school, she won Miss America. <laughs> so I'm like, what do I have to suck? Yeah. Lifting weights now? I'm like, what do I have to, like, I missed America. Like, what the heck? You know? And uh, that kind of <laughs> flew out the window. And I remember watching her. Um, win Miss America. Now I knew she was going to win. I mean, I just knew it. Yeah. I was like, oh, she going she's going to win this. And she went I was like, oh, the, 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 the. <laughs> now this is what I got to do. It's like, man, I knew she was going to win. It wasn't like, oh, come on, I know you. I knew she was going to win. And so it was a uh, It was an interesting thing because you, you have that as a as a sibling, you have that pride. Of course. But you're like, ah, oh. then it, it's a reflection on you. So every phone call for months on months on end and you know back in the day i'm i'm an 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 older man now you know um so we had one telephone you know one line and a whole you know no call waiting so every phone call was for my sister like every (laughs) phone call and i was like can i get a phone call maybe once from somebody um did she let you wear the tiara (laughs) funny enough for my senior picture my rebe- little rebellious self, I was a really small kid as well. I took her dress that she won in and got in it and put her tiara on and used it as my senior picture. And they wouldn't let me use it because they said it was disrespectful. I was uh, like, but that's the whole point. <laughs> so, yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, but so, it, but it's, uh, but going back to that and going into the same business, you know, she's in the yeah. same business. Yeah paving my to carve out your own way is is a hard road when you have an older sibling and a lot of people don't even realize that we're siblings because i've tried to make my career my career right. and have been successful doing it that way 
But uh, I still get to this to this day. Hey, you, you Vanessa's brother? I go, no, she's my sister because it starts here. That's why you talking to me. It starts yeah, my yeah. I was wondering if there was a certain point you're just like, oh, oh yeah, of course she. Mm-hmm. Oh well, of course she got this role. Of course, where you're just like, I'm done. I'm just gonna do do my best. I'm just just over it. That's exactly what you, you, you had to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like that because I was like, so I decided to go to George. She went to Syracuse. And as a matter of fact, I always wanted to be a sports broadcaster. And I got into Syracuse, which is the Bob Costas, the, the Gumble, oh, the wow. number one sports broadcasting school. And I got into the school, but I was like, you know what? I can't do it. I can't do another four years of being the sister or being the, <laughs> being the brother of, of her. And I was like, you know what? I'm going the other direction. So I went south of Georgetown in a good school. I got a liberal arts degree, a psychology degree. And just try to carve my own way, yeah. and then I got into you know acting after I. So how did that happen? How did you end up going from carving your own way, psychology, into show business? Uh, well, I came out right after I graduated uh, um, college, Georgetown, and I studied studied abroad in Italy, which was a an amazing ex- experience just to grow as an as an artist and um, to get in touch with, you know, you look at Florence. And I literally walked into the villa. Georgetown owns a villa there, and I studied there for a semester. And you look at Florence, and it looks like a painting. I'm like, oh, no wonder the Renaissance started here, because it's so beautiful. So getting a liberal arts degree, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. So I was like, let me let me go to law school. I was going to go to law school and become a lawyer. My parents were always like, you know, your sister's in the, in the entertainment <laughs> business. We want you to have a real job. And uh, took the LSATs, and, and I applied to Georgetown Law, and... I was like, you know, but I'm going to take a year off, you know, before I go to law school. And and then I moved right out to California to uh, and my sister was living in here at the time. So I came out here and then uh, I was on a uh, classic concentration with Alex Trebek game show. Oh, wow. And I won 32 grand. I won a Jeep and I won all kinds of stuff. I was like, OK, you know, I kind of like it for me. <laughs> exactly. And uh, and then I was actually in the in the record industry. I worked okay. uh, I worked. Um, a and R for uh, a Mercury Records, wow. uh, Wing Wing Mercury Records, and Tony 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 and my yeah. sister and well, uh, Brian McKnight, well. yeah, yeah, and then did some promotion like college promotion like that. You, you were talking, we were talking about hustling before, absolutely. As a, as a young twenty, you know, twenty year twenty one year old yeah. kid trying to hustle to get where you need to get. Sure. In the in the music just industry, just getting any attention, getting people out to the show, and and you know, we were also talking about what that industry looks like today now it's yeah. a totally different monster totally uh so i did you know college promotion and trying to get i had uh vanilla ice's um demo tape so i was like <laughs> really like this uh and then uh i was in the i was gonna go okay let me be an entertainment lawyer or let me get in the record industry for a while but you could see the writing on the wall where you could actually fall up like you get fired and then you get hired somewhere else and yeah. get a better job it was so bizarre and I always wanted to get into performing because I am a performer. I mean, since I was in nursery school, I've been performing in some some way. I, uh, and uh, so I, I came uh, trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. And I did a play and I was 25 and, and they're like, well, are you going to do this or not? And I literally all my friends from Georgetown were going to law school, doctors, business school. And I'm like, I don't want to be poor. Like, I want to have a job. And I don't want to be, you know, to, as an actor, you just have to give everything up and throw all caution into the wind. And I was like, okay, let me just do it. And as long as I see progress in my career, I'll just keep funding it. So I don't recommend this. <laughs> <laughs> but for six years, I had eight credit cards, eight to ten credit cards. And I would put all of my here, pay rent for this one, yeah. pay transfer balances, and I was juggling, and I got into fifty five thousand dollars in credit card debt. So I was burning about six grand a year in finance charges. But as long as I saw forward progress in my career, I would keep going. And that's a tough that's a tough pill to swallow, thinking that. You know, am I going to have to file bankruptcy at you know 27? That's going to affect my credit, and it got really, really hard. And I used to do a video diary of myself every night, um, from like 25 to 29, where I would just recap the day or what's going on. And 
I just found them and I had them converted and I found a one from when I was 27 and I go, I'm broke. I was like, I'm broke. I look at my bills. I showed the bills on the wall. It was a, oh, wow. had a video cam, you know, like a little old video camera. Yeah. I said, look at my bills on the wall. I had all, you know, posts on the wall. I'm like, I got $10 in my wallet and I, uh, you know, it's hard. And, and watching that, it actually, I just got chills thinking about it because I was like, oh, wow, that was like real, you know? Uh, but I saw as long as I believed in myself mm-hmm. and believed in my talent and invest. Because I said, okay, look, my friends are going to law school. They're going to, they kind of have $70,000 a year to go to law school. Mm-hmm. I was like, so this is my law school. This is my, this is sure. my grad school. I'm going to spend the money and then hopefully it'll pay off. And then I got a couple, I got a movie here, a little movie there, and just built up. And I got a, a TV show called Hype on the WB network before the CW. I remember you know, that WB. The WB yeah. network, the little frog. Yeah. yeah. And I did a sketch comedy show. And so I was hustling, also doing stand up. Yeah, okay. Uh, I wasn't a big, uh, I'm not, I don't love stand up comedy. Like these, some comics love it. Mm-hmm. But I did it as a uh, means to an end. So I had a show over at uh, Luna Park, which is right on Robertson. And uh, like Zach Galifianakis was there, Dane Cook, like they came through and and I was just trying to do my own thing. And then I got on this show called uh, Hype, which is a sketch comedy show with Frank Caliendo, who does yeah. all the impressions. Yeah, boys, and yeah. uh, and uh, there was 10 of us and we did 17 episodes, knocked my dead off just like that. Right. On. So then I could start over like then yeah. <laughs> I start with <laughs> now nothing. Now I'm ready. <laughs> now it's real, and I have something behind me. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of it is about the having faith in yourself, and and not not getting. I mean, there's it's there's trying times when you're trying to get ahead and hustle in, in your career sure. and trying to get go forward and. Well, that hustle has changed so much. I mean, we were just talking about this in the music industry, but we have a lot of friends that do who are in comedy, and <clears throat> it's so when you were going through all those things to, to strengthen your uh, your acting chops and get some parts, it's, well, we're gonna do some acting and then we'll do some uh, stand-up and then we'll probably let's do some, we'll try to write some sketch. And now it's, well, now you gotta have a YouTube channel, you have to have a podcast, you have to have. Exactly. And, and it's just. And it's a different ball game. It's a do- totally different ball game. And it's interesting, you know, I'm, 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 I'll be 51 this year. So it, it's, to try to, um, transition between the old school <laughs> mindset of yeah. hustle and there's a lot of great actors out there who are not working yeah there's right. a lot of youtube you know stars vine stars who got deals yeah so it's hard to wrap your head around what do i have to do to stay relevant so to speak and or you know get in on the on the social media platforms or do something to get likes and and not take away from the content of the studying that you did you know as an actor well of course i mean to have to shuffle it all to all of the work that you've put in to to get better and now i'm busking for likes and, <laughs> exactly and, and, busking views. For likes. and the more outrageous weird shit that i do the better the views like i just it's not what i trained for right, right? it's it's I right totally understand so it's uh but you have to believe in yourself. Yeah. Bottom line and everything. Well, let's you... break that down a little further because obviously you got to get in the room. You right. Gotta, you got to get to know these people. So were there strategies or techniques that you employed sort of identifying who you had to know or who you had to meet to get things moving? And when you did get that opportunity, were there mm-hmm. some strategies that you employed to get to that audition? Because it's far different from, you know, rubbing shoulders with someone at a bar to actually, all right, here's your audition. Right. Well... First of all, no one is a small person. When I when I say that, an assistant. If you see an assistant, you you never know who what they're going to become and what who they're going to be. An assistant, someone, a barista, whoever you t- always communicate with them and be nice to them and talk to them as individuals as opposed to what can you do for me, which you find a lot in Hollywood is all about, well, if you can't do anything for me, why should I care about you? You need to care about everybody because I've seen assistants become heads of of divisions that have come back to me. It's like I remember you when you came in on Valentine's Day and you brought, you know, chocolate roses for the staff (laughs) just to say thank you for your hard work. And I remember that. Um, So that's the part of the building the relationships is 
is always making sure that you treat everybody equally, so to speak. Um, and remember, and remember where you were, and where other people were there, and they're just there. Everyone's trying to get to their their own pinnacle. Yeah, we used to have a saying back in the day, back in New York when we were running programs, and I know it's kind of silly now because he's actually president, but we would say, yeah. you know, janitor, Donald Trump, get in an elevator, you treat them the same. Right. A lot of people get that confused. They go, oh, this person's ahead of me, he has higher dominance socially, I gotta win his impression, but who cares about this guy? Well, you know, that's not the way the world works because one day the janitor could be your boss. And you if never you're, know. you're not paying attention and giving value to everyone, which is what we say here, give value, which would be attention, Perfect. acceptance, approval, right? We're going to know whether or not <laughs> you're a good person based on how you're treating everyone, right? Exactly. We're looking at those cues too. So when you dismiss people below you and this is a town full of social climbers, that person could climb two, three rungs ahead of you, and now they're a decision maker. Exactly, exactly. So one of my techniques that I use for, for that and for in interpersonal relationships is if it's a, first of all, when I fly, when I go, I, I fly a lot. I've been to 47 countries now. And so whenever I fly, I buy three bags of Toblerone chocolates, which are like, they're expensive. They're like you know $30 worth of chocolate. But every time I get on a flight, I have many chocolates that I give to the, um, if I see a, a, a service worker, all the people who are doing the, the flights, the women who takes your ticket. Yeah. When I, when I first get on, I give it to the, the three front stewards and the pilots. And I go to the back and I make sure that they have, you know, a chocolate. And people are so appreciative of just people aren't nice anymore. No, I mean, they're not <laughs> nice. in an airport and it even gets my blood boiling. And sometimes I can be a not nice person in those situations. So to be on the receiving end of that constantly, the airplanes oh, are getting imagine? tighter, they're cramming people in. So yeah, just that little so a small, small touch. gesture of kindness, even, even just saying, looking at their name tag and thank you, Anne. People are like, Oh, like, how do you know my name? Cause no one ever pays attention anymore to, like no, you. Well, how are you serving me right now? What What do you take my ticket? You know, do 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 this for me, do that for me, as opposed to oh, you're a you're a human being too. So let me treat you like a human being and say oh, thanks, Anne, I appreciate that. So I always make sure, and if I'm being served, if I'm on the phone, especially if I'm on the phone with, um, like customer service, I always write down the first thing I do is like hi, Denpac. You know, <laughs> wherever yeah. they are, you know, nice. To, thank you, Denpa, because people will work harder for you as well. Sure. You know, n just because you're treating them like a human being as opposed to being. Um, so that's one of my big things is asking people their name or, right. you know, making sure that that they're treated like we're equals to, right. a, to a certain extent. What I've found in the world that we're in today, when you go out of your way to, to be nice, immediately everyone's like, what do you want from me? No, I'm just being nice. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Right. Because everyone has an agenda. <laughs> everyone has an agenda. So I try to do small things like, you know, learn someone's name or, or bring bring some candy or bring something. Uh, not to even set me apart, but just to acknowledge. It's, a lot of people are just not acknowledged now. Yeah. Nowadays. It, no one just acknowledges you know, people. So well, I think we have to acknowledge our listeners for their questions. Yes, that's a good idea. I know Johnny and I have a ton of questions for you, but we have some <laughs> listeners who phoned in, wrote in some awesome questions all around breaking the ice. So we have those queued up for you. Hey, AJ, Johnny, and Chris. Um, I'm wondering whether what's the smoothest uh, ice breaking technique that you can come up with? I think you kind of just answered it with the terrible rounds. That's great. Yeah, I like it. Well, ice breaking techniques is, is, first of all, people also like to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. Asking questions. I love asking questions. I mean, if you ask anybody, you know, you get to know who they are and they will start to relax around you and then you can, you know, you, you can feel more comfortable with yourself. If, even if you're nervous and you ask, and you put it on someone else. Also, in dating aspects, if you ask a woman a question, Guys, we're known for re being report talkers as opposed to rapport talkers. You know, we'll say, exactly. and to impress a woman, I would say, well, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. To another guy, they're like, wow, he's got a lot of stuff. So a woman, they're like, I don't want to hear about all your stuff. I want you to talk ass about me. Why aren't you? He doesn't want to know about me. But 
if you ask questions and let them go, I'm telling you, it's a, <laughs> yeah, we teach a conversation formula and a lot of our clients come from an analytical background. Mm -hmm. They get paid for their analysis pretty <clears throat> well, talking to computers, but when it comes to talking to humans, they stumble over and, and much like this question, right? They want to know the icebreaker, the, the magical combination of words when in reality, it's taking interest in the other person. Exactly. So our formula is we ask a question, we have to listen to their answer, which is the other challenging part, right? <laughs> exactly. Because a lot of times we play hot potato conversational. I'll just ask a question. I can start thinking about what I was going to eat in Iceland and how we get into the Blue Lagoon and all this stuff. <laughs> right. And then come back and go, oh, wait, wait what? What do you, what do you ask? Yeah. And then yeah. ask another question. And all of a sudden you ask too many questions and now the balance is off. And right. the person's like, he's not even listening to me. So the third part is always answer their answer in a statement. You have to disclose something. So then they have a little bit to work with. Exactly. Right. And if they want to take more interest in you, they can. But it is key being curious and taking interest in other people. So in that situation where, you know, you got a big audition. Right. You know, you got a short amount of time. Right. And you want to stand out. We talked a little bit about what to wear and a little bit about body language. But do you have anything else in the room that you're using conversationally, either at the start or the end of the audition? To well, I always in? ask. I always ask, how are you? You know? And, and, and they will volley something back to you like, how are you? And then you can go into and then you can have a little bit of a rapport because uh, in a lot of situations, whether, whether it's auditions or even in, in life, um, they just want to know, can they work with you? It's not necessarily can you do the job. We can all do the job. There's a lot of great actors out there that can do the job. But a lot of them are just like, can, do I want to be on a set with you do I want to work with for you? Three, three months in ice or you know in morocco and not be sick of you you know you know so uh it's a lot of the report of just like being comfortable with who you are but talking to them and having some sort of rapport that they know that you can that you can do the job and that you're a, a a, a capable person yeah, as well as an actor a lot of times their job is riding on you to be professional and perform right. right if they're the casting director they're like oh yeah you got to choose this guy he is great for this role and then you're not on set on time and and you're being an asshole well then guess who's going to get the heat the right. casting director so they're being very judicious about who they're selecting and even in in, uh, in auditions on, on job uh, job interviews and stuff when if you're interviewing for a job uh, to be able to they have the the mindset of the sooner they find who they want, their job becomes easier. You're the, you're, if you can show them, they don't have to look anymore. They don't want to be looking for eight to have twenty people at twenty interviews. We love um, HR. Johnny and I just line them up interview yeah. after interview. <laughs> yeah, no one wants. No that. one wants that. They want to fill the role you and move on. So show them that you can fill the role and and let's you know let's call it a day. But having that mindset of like, oh well, you want me because, you know, it'll make your job easier. Now this Fantastic. is a good one. We got a great question from Matthew C. He asked in our Facebook group, any good tricks for getting people to put down their phones and start talking? I always feel a little odd starting those conversations since I assume they're busy. Mm. That's a tricky one. It's because it's a generational thing too. Um, we're so tethered to our phones now. It's, it's hard to not take a break from it. Well, we're, we're losing our manners as we go down this technology rabbit hole and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm, and it's always, it's funny because of our guys who are coming through, they're looking for opportunities to get better socially. So they're already committed to putting the phone down, breaking out of that, putting themselves out there. And what they're finding and what I'm seeing, and the question always comes up, like I've, I've went out of my way, I'm starting to talk to people, but they're not talking back. Is it something I, I'm doing? 20 years ago, the idea of having to, to work to get yourself more extroverted, because it just seemed that everyone had it going on was extroverted, right. right? And now here we are in this technology age where everyone is now getting more and more introverted because of that technology. So just because you've, went out of your way to look to get better socially and put yourself out there doesn't mean that the rest of the world is ready for that as well and and it's looking like it's now reversed one of the cool one of the coolest things that i that i saw in the last couple of years is you know you go to a concert now you, know, you go to jay-z and every yes. everyone is recording the concert 
everyone has their phone up recording it and really not paying attention to what's going on. I went to an Ario Speedwagon <laughs> Chicago con- in Chicago concert. It's all people in their you know forties, fifties, sixties. No one had the, like no one. I took a video <laughs> of people. Right. You know, I'm like no one has their phone up. Like everyone was sitting there enjoying the show, and I think that's we really lost that 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 essence of being in the moment. So you really have to force yourself to put the phone down and really enjoy what is going on right now. Because even if you have a memory of it, if you didn't experience it, how you know, what does I've, it do for you? I've seen it now where people are getting angry because the performer requested that everyone puts their phones on. They're like, I'm not going to that show. He won't let me put my film the the show. I'm like, it, he's not being rude. You are being rude. Right. You are because being. Everyone loves watching low lit iPhone <laughs> photos of you and videos of you at the show bouncing around, not even being able to see what's on stage. I've never. I, I, it's insane. I admit, I've pulled out my phone. I felt dumb afterwards. I've never gone back and watched those videos. No. I've never gone back right, and right. been like, oh my God, oh, yeah. this Zed moment where he dropped. Never. Right. It's, so it's reflexive. To the question, I, I like being a little cheeky and asking a question. Did you get my meme? Did you get my like on that photo? Just calling it out, getting them to snap yeah. out of that technology moment. Because a lot of people are aware that they're on their phones, but it's a crutch, right? They right. don't have the confidence to just stand there by themselves. So the second they feel discomfort, they're like, oh, let me get some dopamine. So if you just call it out in a cheeky way, like, hey, did you get my, mm-hmm. my uh, status update there? They'll perk up what's going on oh okay he wants to have a conversation that's a good idea yeah yeah that's a good idea I, well i think everyone needs to start minding where their attention is socially anymore i mean john caught me yesterday we were in a meeting before uh, we did our interview with Oren, and he's like do you mind being present for the meeting I'm like duh sorry it's like and it's own and it was an unconscious thing it was in it's my reflex head. now it's it's become so reflex. it's you know i think as well in our classroom we collect phones everyone's are, phones. Perfect. Yeah. And it's so funny because uh, today, Cassandra left the phones on the, the coffee table. Normally, she just takes them in another room. Yeah. And as <clears> I'm <throat> lecturing, phones are going off, and I can see the anxiety in the room. Like, oh, <laughs> was that my phone? I think that was I, – no, I shouldn't. Right. I, and Those things got to go. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. You're just so tied to it. It's just habit, right? Boom. So, but how do, you, how, do you, how do you break that? Well, you, you, your question of like how do you get – some that we got, how do you get someone to stop being on their phone? And I guess it's just in trying to engage them in like asking questions that we were talking about before. That's the only, it seems like that's the only way to, or the, the meme or fitting into that, what they're doing and trying to bring it, bring them out of it. Right. Realize, yeah. Hey, there's real <laughs> this, life over yeah, here. Exactly. <laughs> well, the other thing is, you know, it's saying a lot about the other person that you're trying to sp- speak to now. And if, I'm, it, they're telling you a lot about how they're viewing things socially. That's that's a good filter now of like, do I really want to be de- dealing with somebody who cannot seem to be, get off social media, who has to scan everyone's uh, Insta and start posting on it for hours at a time? That's, uh, that's something to take in consideration now. Exactly. Well, the new iPhone OS, I don't know if Android's doing it. I'm sure they, they're probably already doing it. I should, <laughs> Apple's so far behind these days. But the new OS is supposed to have a feature that actually tracks your usage of these apps. And I think just raising awareness to the number of hours you're on it. I know for myself, there was a, an app where you could plant a tree, and if you used an app, the tree died. So the goal was to grow as many trees oh, as wow. possible to build a forest. And Amy and I had a little back and forth. Oh, I'm growing a tree. And she's like, oh, I better put down social and plant one. So I think... If we can quantify it and realize how much time it's sinking away, then we can start to take more control. But a lot of us right now don't even realize how much no. time it's sucking from not, us. Not only that, people don't even like talking on the phone anymore. Oh, Sorry, I'm in that camp. I'm, I'm in that camp. Johnny, you're like, you're also, like, just don't, text me. What do you, don't what do you call mean? me. <laughs> what do you call me for? Don't call me. <laughs> text me. That's been my, my – there's been a few bandmates who have gotten so mad at me. They're calling me and my text back is, am I sleeping with you? Why are you calling me? <laughs> <laughs> we could shoot me a text. Another question here from Bruno, sort of the opposite, right? Instead of getting out of a, instead of getting into a conversation, he'd love to know what's the easiest way to eject out of a low value conversation, uh, especially someone that you realize you're not interested in talking to. And I would assume 
someone in your position has been approached by some people where you're like, I would like to wrap this up. I, I got to go. I, I got to get moving. Any tricks to exiting those conversations? Wow. So I usually give them if you I think the, a lot of it comes when you're already trying to resist it and they feel you're resisting. So they keep coming back. But if you directly <laughs> deal with them and talk to them. And then you can do your exit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the, the more that you can, let me give you focus for 20 seconds and complete focus. Yes. Nice to meet you. Thank you. It's very nice. And as opposed to, yeah, I got this because they'll be like, oh, well, he's an asshole, an asshole. You didn't even, you know, engage it with me. But if you can give people, I know it's hard sometimes, but just give them 5, 10, 15 seconds of actual genuine, I am acknowledging you and what you are doing or asking of me right now, but I got to go. Right. So my thing is if, if you can engage them honestly for a limited amount of time and then, you, and then literally say, I'm busy, I have to go. That's that was the only thing that I do when people come like last I was at the, the I was in Chicago last night at the at the Cubs game and I'm just standing there on the side is also which is an interesting thing getting recognized you know in LA everyone no one recognizes me like they recognize but don't like I'm just you know another actor in Chicago people like coming up to me <laughs> going can I just ask you something You're like yeah you know and so a guy came up to me. He's like, oh, I loved you on Curb Your Enthusiasm. He said, can I get a selfie? I'm like, yeah, sure. So you give him a selfie. And his friend's like, no, I don't know who he is. He's like, but can I get a selfie too? <laughs> I'm like, if you, if you, he's like, I didn't know really you know who you are, but I'm going to get it just in case. Just I got put it on social media, just in case. I was like, all right. So if you engage with people and then know that you can, you know, get out of, get out of there, but give them a, a genuine engagement for a limited amount of time. So it's it's funny you should say that because living in L.A. now for almost 10 years, I'm of that same mind. Like celebrity, I'm not going to bother them. They're living their life. I, and Johnny takes a little bit different of a tact where he wants to, especially his, his idols, people he looks up to, he wants to give them their props. Sure. Uh, you know, where is the line for you in that? Obviously, you are living life. You're trying to get some things done here and you're working on a lot of things. Well, I've, I've seen it more with my sister as well. Because uh, my sister is, you know, famous. She's, she's world famous. So uh, I've seen it and I've learned how to, you know, from how she handles it as well. She's very genuine and takes it. But it's interesting how people will talk about you while you're standing oh, there. Yeah. I, oh, oh, yeah. I thought she was, you know, I thought she was taller than that. Like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm. But if you if you, you know, call him on it a little bit like, you know, I'm right here. Right. Like, I try to do that as much as possible. Like, if you're looking if you're doing the, the, the look like you're like they're trying not to look at you, right. but they're trying to recognize you like I know him from somewhere. I'll go. Yes. Yeah. It's it. That's me. Whatever you whatever it is that you think it is. Yep. It is me. And they go, well, where do I know you from? I go, you tell me. <laughs> Come on. You're not going to tell right. me like, no, I'm not. You tell me. And I said, but in about 30 minutes, you'd be like, oh, I know that's the guy from uh, that's all. Yeah. So I just. Kind of, it's it's fun. I I look at it as is first of all, it's flattering that yeah. people get to see you. You know, well, your it's work. also tough though because especially as we're talking about this social media world, like anything can be taken out of context, mm -hmm. right? It's like you can actually be late for an audition and not have the time, and someone be like, "That guy's an asshole," and then it goes viral. Right? Look at this. Can you believe this? Right. So I just try to stay out of it because I know how precious time is, and living in LA, how difficult it is to get places. So it's like you do you props to you well i want to know there's for the most part there's a there's if i see somebody who whose band i love or whatnot there's there is they oh there's so and so and i can let it walk but there's there's also certain people that if i see i just go in the, the like c conscious brain shuts off and now i have to, it's yeah. just like it's i'm on autopilot don't even realize what's happening till after the fact like what did i do and uh and, it, and there's only certain people like if I, for whatever reason if I ran into Joan Jet like it would be over like right, right. I would feel so bad for what would be about to happen because <laughs> you and, love that woman and and you love that woman and I wouldn't be able to shut it off like I would just have to go over it would be an autopilot response but there's many that I see of like oh a wave um, I remember seeing Henry Rollins having lunch one day and as i was leaving i was like oh that's henry so i went to the door and i just to give him a wave and he's like 
gave me that salty Henry Rollins look. Like, really, bro? I'm trying to eat. Like, yeah, I still want to wave. <laughs> <laughs> but you can. You, but you also you you know what it's like to to deal with celebrities. So you're not the type of person. I mean, if it was Joan Jett, you'd be like gushing. Oh yeah. But you'd have some sort of. Some people don't have any kind of decorum whatsoever. They will like <laughs> sit down at the table and oh, try wow. to have lunch with you. You're like, no, no, no. But you, you know, if the fact that you gave Henry a little wave, that was good enough that yeah. you got an acknowledgement that, where well, however he's going to acknowledge it for you. But yeah. at least he 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 knew that you knew who he was. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I, I think it's fine. Yes, that's fine. You know. We got another recorded call coming at you. Hey, AJ, Johnny, and Chris. This is Nick. Uh, Chris, I'm curious to hear how you think uh, approaching and opening people who are used to being approached by many people, so people like celebrities, how you would think that is different from talking with people that maybe aren't used to that level of volume of interaction. Cheers. I think is there's it's it's kind of twofold when it first of all it depends on who the celebrity is or who the person of interest is. And you can usually, body language, as you said, you can usually see how people are reacting to or are they open to anything like that. If, they, if you're trying to acknowledge them and they're not into it, don't do it. I mean, pay attention. I think if you pay attention to how people are, uh, whether so it's eye a, contact even, a, big even one. a woman in the, in the, in the gym or if you're, if you're a man talking to a woman, if you can see that she is not there – to talk to anyone it's going to be really hard to try to to talk to her um but if you go to a club it may be a little uh, uh, you know a different vibe uh and also with celebrities remember celebrities are people too they're just regular people that just do a job that you know has high exposure um treat them like if you were at lunch or something and giving them their proper respect uh, before you launch into, I never do this, <laughs> but <laughs> you know how many times I never do this, but you're doing it now. <laughs> so, so tr try not to, you know, give them their space. If they're with their family or something, or, you know, they're in the middle of a meeting or something, don't, don't, um, you know, disturb them. But if you have an opportunity that looks like it's an opportunity. Just pay attention. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, pay there are more public opportunities for it. Open body language. The celebrities making eye contact with you. Like they realize they know you want to come up and they're acknowledging it. Right. Versus like, you know, sunglasses. Right. I'm not even paying attention to you. My arms are crossed. Just leave me the hell alone. Right. Those signals are the, they're universal. They're the girl in the gym signals. They're the guy in the club. It does not matter. There are signals that, are, okay, now's a good time to come right. talk to me. And you know what? Now's not a good time. But unfortunately, right. a lot of people aren't paying attention to body language, eye contact, and those opportunities. Exactly. There's an, another piece to it, too, now with all the, the Internet celebrities. And what I'm finding fascinating about it is there's all these YouTube stars who started these channels with commentary or whatever it might be, unboxing. But... It's, it was an opportunity for them to do this thing that they enjoyed and speak to people, and they're like the most introverted people, and now they are mega YouTube stars. And they'll always post the video of having to go to like VidCon or some YouTube event, and they're just terrified of having to walk out in the crowd because they have all these adoring fans that, that they don't, it's not like they got into this because they wanted that adulation, as right. a lot of actors enjoy having that uh, me as a musician i love to have just played and talked to everyone after the show or to get recognized out exactly a completely different thing yeah yeah it's it's the the whole internet thing is is and social media is such a crazy new revelation in terms of human interaction i you know it's and it's happening so fast it's so we're fast. all everyone's dealing with it trying to catch up to it and trying to stay ahead of it or it's just incredible. And what it's precipitating, you know, is this change in reality consumption, right? It's like now the conflict has to be through the roof because that's the only way to draw an eyeball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Same thing with, with the Instagram story, the instant. I need that snapshot of your life. I need to be in the bathroom with Chris Williams and know exactly what he's reading right now. Right. It's, 
that level of like, hey, come on, you know, I am a person too. I need some space. I don't need to show you everything I do. But there are also people who are making themselves celebrity because they're willing to go that extra mm-hmm. mile. They're willing to tell you what they're eating and what's going on in the bathroom. And they're slim tea. <laughs> 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 they're willing to, to sell their slim tea to you. Here's the detox, like, you know. Here's a great question from Jeff. He wants to know, what are the signs for when someone finds a question uninteresting? Kind of piggybacking a little bit on the celebrity, right? For example, if you're dating someone and ask, what do you do for work? And they start going through their cookie cutter response. You could try digging in with more thought provoking how or why questions. But if they hate their job and want to leave it at work, I'm wondering if there's, I'm wondering if it's just better to jump ship and move on to the next topic. I feel like he's answering his own question a little bit yeah, here. Yeah. He kind of like he's probably started to ask. And he's like, oh, maybe I sh-. I feel like going back to the body language thing, right? There's there's first the signal from the body language. I don't really want to be talking about this, right? They're expressionless or negative emotion on their face, crossing their arms, kind of closing off, not making eye contact, looking despondent. And then you can tell in the words, right? If they're not adding any color or emotion and one short word answers, then it's probably not the topic they want you drilling down with how and why questions right. into. But also the, the the questions are important as well. I mean, if you're going to come with rote questions or just things that people say all the time. And I find very to, few people right now have a job that they are just so over the moon happy with that they just want to share and talk about with everyone. Right. Right. Stop. Right. I feel like this is pretty much universal that most people don't want to talk about their job. And I like people look at me and Johnny and I'm sure they look at you and they're like, you have the greatest job in the world. This is so amazing. I want to be you. And when you're living it, when it's your job, you're kind of like, it's you know, job. I just want to punch out. Like, <laughs> it's a, ah, that's great. I five, could use a break. Oh, yeah. 6 p.m. <laughs> great. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so that job topic, I know it's it's easy, right? It's a low hanging fruit. Very low. But it leads to boring conversation that most people don't want to have. Exactly. Another recorded question. This audio question is from Trent. Hey, how's it going? Uh, My name is Trent Wilkes. Uh, I uh, I just want to bring up, I've always had a bit of an issue with eye contact. Uh, So if I'm going out with the guys to like a whiskey or like a rum bar or something like that, and someone's giving me eye contact, it's hard for me to sometimes know, you know, if I'm giving her like the the heebie-jeebies or if like there's a... uh, sense of attraction so i would love some pointers about that thank you so much and goodbye well there's a difference between eye contact and staring at someone <laughs> if you if you stare at anybody long enough they will get uncomfortable if you're just like glaring at them you know i think people also just don't trust their gut enough like mm-hmm. if you're already saying heebie-jeebies <laughs> you're feeling it they're feeling it. exactly like it is a guttural response I'm probably staring too long. I yeah. probably make it too much eye contact. If you're feeling it, that other person is definitely feeling it. Well, we've always said, listen, if somebody's catching your eye, you want to go talk to them, go make your move. Just get it over with. Uh, because the more time you spend looking at that person, the easier it's you're going to find yourself in heebie-jeebie role. And the right. flip side is, <laughs> if you are in heebie-jeebie role, she's not going to make eye contact again. Right. right? She is not going to glance back over at you and go, hey, look at that heebie-jeebie guy over there. I should probably look more. Right? Most women, they get that feeling. They're like, I am not looking back over there. You can't pay me to look in that guy's direction. So to your point, if you feel maybe there is something, you break eye contact, you come back, and there's a glance, then, as Johnny said, make your, make move. your move. You Don't have to make it, though, longer. immediately. I, I was always caught up in the in the whole looking and then make the move and, like, but should I? And I look again, you know, not the heebie-jeebie, but then I would be like, oh, well, should I? And you talk yourself Absolutely. out of. Yes, you do. Oh, oh well, she's looking behind yeah, me. Yeah, she didn't really. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. and, and then it gets to, well, I, now I've bl- blown it. I should have went over there when I had the chance. Right. Or is she looking at me again because she still wants me to do that? It's, it's, it's <laughs> you have to make that. Move. And it's funny. A lot of times you can tell the attractiveness of a woman, too, by how much I can't she gives you back. Because the some of the most beautiful women will not look at you at all but some of the other ones be like you know. yeah, it's usually the girls you don't want looking at you that'll go crazy eyes on you right <laughs> so here's a a question from johnny and i and, and it, it really follows a theme that a lot of our, our listeners have and, and obviously it's that fear of rejection no one wants to be rejected rejection is terrifying you're in a career where it's a part of the game and it's a full contact sport so 
I would love to hear some of your mindsets for handling that rejection. I know you talked a little bit about after the audition, you go back to your car, like I could have done better. Is there a time frame you give yourself to go through that process and then table it? How are you handling rejection in your career? As I said, I've done this for 25 years now. And what I've learned is, especially in my business, I'm a product, I'm a commodity. What am I bringing to the, to the show? So if you want to hire me, I've been hired because of me and I've been hired because I fit the role. You can't, I hate to say it, you can't take it personally, if that makes any sense. Even though it's a personal thing, if they want someone else, they want someone else that may have nothing to do with you. And the thing about my business also is you don't know why they rejected you. So they could have rejected you because you were bad. They could have rejected you because they already had a deal with someone else. They could have, you don't know that. So the sooner that you can get it out of your head that it's just not what it's meant to be. And it's, but it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to, to own the fact that, especially if you really want something badly and you don't get it, why, 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 why? But you have to give it, acknowledge it, acknowledge that feeling. Don't suppress it or, so, you know, Run well, from it or anything like that. You got to say, wow, I really wanted that. I really wished it was me. Okay, on to the next thing. Because a lot of times I've found when something doesn't happen, if you were doing that, you would not have gotten this opportunity down here. Sure. So always have a a flip side of, or you didn't want that job because that job, even though it seemed great, it was a nightmare compared to this job that you just got. And you look back and you go, oh, wow. I, wow. A lot, one of the things that I, I've learned also in my sagacious age um, is really taking the time to not waste your energy on things that you have no control over yes if you can't control it why are you getting upset about it i remember i was i was and one of the crystallized uh, uh times that it happened to me was i was with my sister we were going flying back to la from new york and we both had separate flights mine was leaving like 30 minutes before hers and we were taking the same car together she was late and i was in the car with her and i'm looking at it she's gonna make her flight just, you know, because she has someone taking her and I'm going, I'm not going to make my flight. And that whole time down there, I'm rocking in my seat and I'm upset and I'm like, you know, God, what am I going to do now? I got to do this. I got to do this. And I'm so upset. And I'm like, you know what? You can't control. You can't make the traffic go away. You can't make this car go faster. You can't just if you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. And I remember I was like, I just gave it up and they dropped her off first. Of course. And then I got dropped off and I just like, like, you know, didn't lollygag, but you know, I got, did my stuff and I made the flight and I was like, wow, all of that wasted energy, all of that stress and, and, and gnawing of the teeth and sweat and that was all wasted energy. Why get upset about something you can't control? And I was like, oh, wow. Now it's hard to keep that into practice because you'll get triggered by something right away. But the more that you can know that if if you can control it or if you're in control of it, that's what you can that's what you can do. But if it has nothing to do with you, let it go. Try to let it go as much as possible. So as from rejection standpoint, if I don't get something and someone else got it, um, I can't I can't stress over it. I'll get I'll get mine. And I was on a TV show. Uh, just coming off a TV series, just shot a big pilot and, and was on two recurrings on something. And I was like, oh, it's just a, you know, what's the next job for me? It's coming up. I didn't work for six months in anything. And I'm going, oh, what the, I'm not like, and I, I have a long career of, you know, solid work and I did not work for six months. And, you know, you got a mortgage and you got, you're trying to get uncomfortable. But I was like, okay, you know what? But you'll get a job. It will come. You keep doing what you're doing and you'll get a job. And then I went on a big roll. And then, you know, after I get one job, then I got. But that's the also the part of this business is I call it uh, riding the wave. It's just like surfing. Acting is just like surfing to me where you go out on your paddle, you get a good board, you're in shape, you're ready. You know, you've been done enough stuff and you wait for your wave 
and your wave may come. You may see other people may, riding there, the big wave, but you try to get up, and, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But you get your wave. But in the meantime, enjoy the sun. Enjoy being out on your board and just, you know, <laughs> just trying to make the best. And, and with that metaphor, right? And then what happens to the wave? You get thrown into the ocean, right? <laughs> so you can't ride the wave too long. You got to realize that it's an opportunity. Make the most of it, and there will be more. Right. Uh, your long game, and I think going in with the mindset is, as long as I do the best I can and I nail this, even if I don't get this role, hey, that person on the other end, they saw something in me. They saw me bring it. There are other roles down the pipe. Silicon Valley, I read from Mike, jo Mike Judge for Idiocracy, which was 12, 15, 13 years ago? That's right. That, 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 that movie. And Terry Crews became President Camacho. I was just going to ask I read, him for that I role. read for Camacho. You know, and right. I, right. Oh, and that's I, awesome. I thought I did a great job, but Terry Crews is, pre is President Camacho. I mean, you look at Terry Crews, I'm like, oh, well, there you go. You know, that's yeah. what it is. And Mike, and when I put myself on tape for Hoover, he remembered, he said, I remember you from your audition. So it just goes to show you, you're like, oh, wow. You know, people do pay attention sure. if you're doing the be what you can control and the best that you can. You know, and you never know. You never know what, when people are watching. And I, I, this is another thing of, you know, in today's day and age, the having to go out and build resiliency isn't what – it wasn't a, a family, like a parental thing that they made you – do when you're 20 30 years ago it's like you need to go out you need to play on a sports team you need to get knocked around a bit you need to take some lumps and you need to build that resiliency as a young child and we're just not seeing that uh, too much in, in today's uh how children are being raised yeah, um, you don't see that in fact they're, it seems like they're just wrapped in bubble wrap and nothing can happen to them and of course we're seeing when they are now out in the world world the idea of of rejection not getting a job is like terrifying it is it is this is awesome chris oh thank you so, so much uh, that's so much fun guys although i'm not sure john and i are going to be able to get the miss america image out of our head of you <laughs> wearing the tiara and we may show you our magic trick of letting some tolbarone disappear yes nice. all right so, that we can do thank you for stopping by thanks for having me guys awesome I really appreciate information it. for our listeners handling rejection breaking that ice it was a lot of fun i appreciate it thank you thanks, thanks, thank you yeah.